All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, and welcome, Richard. Uh, you know, this is great to uh, kick off the second day of uh, of functional con. Uh, I think it's a great way to kick start the conference with uh, Richard, who uh, you know has done amazing work in the Elm community to start with. At least that's how I've known Richard. Uh, uh, you know, first read his book and then. Uh, used a bunch of the packages that you've built uh, for Elm. Uh, so appreciate that. And then, of course, uh, these days you've been working on a new programming language called Rock. Uh, and I'm sure you'll talk about more about that in your talk. So, uh, all right, without much delay, uh, over to the one and only Richard. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. This is the essence of functional programming. I'm Richard Feldman. So we're here at Functional Conf 2022. This is uh, from the website. And as uh, Naresh mentioned, there are a lot of different programming languages represented here. Um, these are some of the icons that were on the website. There's even more than this, but just in case you're not familiar with all the logos, this is APL, Clojure, C++, Elixir, F Sharp, OCaml, Haskell, Elm, Prolog, Scala, and Java. And like he said, there's, there's even more at the conference. Now, you're going to get a different experience doing pro functional programming in each of these languages. Um, some languages have more or, or different facilities uh, for functional programming than others. And of course, these different experiences are going to lead to different expectations. Like, for example, if you're used to doing functional programming in Haskell and you try doing functional programming in C++, that's just going to be a very different experience. They're just very different languages. Likewise, if you uh, use Elixir versus Prolog, very different experiences. Even uh, programming languages that are sort of dedicated functional programming languages, they're not multi-paradigm at all. They're just functional programming like Clojure and Elm, very different experiences. Um, and these different experiences will lead to different expectations, which sometimes uh, doesn't necessarily lead to a, a good experience. So let me give you an example of this. Um, so uh, as Naresh mentioned, I've been working on this programming language called Rock for the past couple of years. Um, it is a purely functional programming language but because performance is a big focus of the language and not just in terms of like runtime uh, performance, but also in terms of compile time performance, um, we've been building the compiler for Rock in Rust. And really the reason for this is that we wanna go fast. Um, Rust is a systems level programming language, gives you a ton of control over stuff. It's not really known as a functional programming language per se, it's definitely like imperative at its core, but there are a ton of articles about how to do functional programming in Rust. Like, Tons and tons and tons of them. Um, lots of people talking about, here's a, like a, you know, a blog post on how to do functional programming in Rust, a video on how to do functional programming in Rust. There's even a book on how to do functional programming in Rust. So there's lots of people talking about how to do this and, and sort of uh, advocating for it. So um, because I was writing this compiler in Rust, um, this is actually my first time using Rust for a serious project. And uh, I was much more familiar with functional programming. I've been doing it for like 10 years. Um, and so I decided I'm gonna write the parser using parser combinators. So that's what I'm familiar with. And since I'd heard about all this like functional programming and Rust stuff, um, I found this uh, blog post uh, from Bodil Soka, who is awesome. Um, she wrote a great post about how to do parser combinators in Rust, which I actually used to make the initial parser for this programming language. And everything was going okay until I hit a problem. Um, and this commit message, uh, actually, <laughs> this is exactly September 1st, 2019 was when I ran into this problem. And the commit message says, attempt at making a type annotation parser. So at this point, I'd gotten to the point where I could parse like expressions and functions and all these different things. And I was like, okay, let's get to type annotations because Rock's a type check language, it has type annotations. And I got this weird error from the Rust compiler, which said recursion limit reached. Basically what it said is you're doing too much higher order function stuff and I wasn't built for that. So I give up, um, just stop doing that. Uh, I have never seen this happen in any programming language, any compiler I've ever used, um, except for this uh, experience I had in Rust. And needless to say, I was like, well, I, I thought I could do all this functional programming in Rust. What do you, what do you mean recursion limit? Uh, so kind of my, my first takeaway here was this is, this is just not a good experience. Um, clearly, Rust is not designed for heavy use of higher order functions like this. I mean, when you look at these like Rust and per, uh, functional programming and Rust posts, a lot of them just kind of talk about really basic examples, like we're doing a map over an array or, or a vector or something like that. Um, but you never really get into like, what if you have a ton of higher order functions like parser combinators, but it's just built of this giant stack of them. Um, Rust technically can do that to a point, but there comes a point apparently where you just reach the compiler's limit. It's like, no, just don't do this anymore. So that was my first takeaway. My, my second takeaway was, honestly, I'm just not having a great experience trying to do what to me feels like a normal functional programming thing in Rust. 
And yet there's all these other people who have a different experience or, or, or are promoting a different idea of like, yeah, you should do functional programming in Rust. That's a good idea. You know, Rust, Heart, Lambda, um, all these things. And so this, this sort of is an example of us sort of talking past each other. Like I have in my head, based on my experiences, an idea of what functional programming is, but somebody else who's maybe talking about functional programming in Rust, they might have a totally different idea of what functional programming is that maybe doesn't involve parser combinators or anything like it. So this is where these sort of different experiences that we have from doing functional programming in different uh, languages can lead to different expectations and maybe talking past each other and miscommunications like this. I kind of wish in retrospect that I didn't have this idea in my head that Rust was a functional programming language or, or was the language where it's a good idea to do functional programming because based on my idea of functional programming, I was like, you know what? Um, I kind of wish that uh, I hadn't had that idea. I just embraced the imperative aspect of, of Rust because I think it's quite nice for using doing imperative programming in Rust. But with my Elm background, this, this did not set me up for success. So in this talk, I want to explore though, like what is the common ground between all of these, like we're at functional conf. These are lots of different languages, but we're all talking about similar kinds of ideas. And what I wanna try and do is explore this idea of like, what's the essence of functional programming? What's the minimal sort of essential, like irremovable part that at that point we are doing functional programming, no matter what language we're doing it in. And I'm gonna explore this in sort of three angles. First, I wanna talk about what are the minimal language features required to do functional programming? Second, I want to talk about the relationship between functional programming and math, because a common thing that I hear people talk about is that functional programming is about math or, or has a lot to do with math. So what is that relationship? And third, what is the functional programming style? Like regardless of what language you're doing it in, what is the actual FP style? Okay, so let's start, about the, uh, start with the minimal language uh, requirements in terms of features. So a common answer to, to, to this question that I hear in terms of like, what is the actual minimal thing that you need to do functional programming is lexical closures. Now, this is uh, an example of a first class function as a lexical closure, but you might not be familiar with exactly what that term means. So let me go into sort of a, an example of, of what it is. So here we have an inner class in Java. Um, this is uh, an example that comes out of a blog post um, when they were announcing lambdas uh, being introduced in Java 8. And in this blog post, this is on oracle.com, it says, although possible, functional programming in Java was, by any account, obtuse and awkward. And what they're talking about is basically code like this, um, where you're using this inner class in order to define something that, with the lambda syntax, could be defined like this, much more concisely. Now, worth noting that semantically, these two actually do the same thing in Java. Like the inner class even can do the closure thing where it captures stuff from the outer scope. Um, Basically, the difference here is, is largely syntactic sugar. Like you could, like, like the quote says, it was possible to do functional programming in Java using this style of like instantiating a new runnable and making a method called run inside of it, but it wasn't very pleasant. Um, it, it required a lot more code than cer certainly the, uh, the Lambda syntax sugar ended up um, uh, requiring. So, FP in Java has always been possible, but it hasn't always been ergonomic. And now with the introduction of the Lambda syntax, it's more ergonomic. Let me give you another example of, uh, of where FP is possible, but not necessarily ergonomic, this time using a sort of different definition of a Lambda, a different style of closure. I'm going to use sort of JavaScript syntax for this, uh, just for familiarity, because I think most people know JavaScript. Um, let's say I say suffix equals exclamation point. And then I write a function called exclaim, which takes a string. And all it does is it returns that string plus that suffix of exclamation point. So in JavaScript, this, this function would work the way you expect. If you call exclaim passing a string, it'll return it with an exclamation point on the end. But now let's say that when I was calling that, this exclaim function, I just happened to also put suffix like ahead of that in the same scope. Um, let's pretend that we have like a var or a const or something like that, or a let in front of uh, both of these suffixes. So this is not about global variables. This is, let's assume, locally scoped. And then I call exclaim uh, in the same way. So in a language with uh, lexical scope, uh, lexical closures, this will return hello world with a question mark. Even though in the second example, we said suffix equals question marks, if that had a let or a const or a var or something like that in front of it, um, it would be locally scoped and it would not affect uh, this you know, exclaim function. But there's another style of closure where it would not do that, where it would actually use the suffix that's closer to the call site rather than the one that was closer to the definition site. And the difference between these is that the hello world, the exclamation point is lexical scoping, where what matters is 
what was sort of lexically, that is to say, in the source code around it. And then the other style is dynamic binding, which is basically it's it's all about what was in scope around the call site. So this exclaim function is actually going to evaluate suffix from the call site or what's near the call site rather than the definition site like we might expect. So both of these work, but one of them is a lot more ergonomic than the other. There's a reason that basically every language does lexical binding these days. But you might be surprised to hear about a particular programming language that used to do dynamic binding. So this is a talk by David Turner, um, who was the creator of the Miranda programming language, which is the basically the immediate predecessor to Haskell. It's like one of the earliest languages to do um, lazy functional programming. Um, and he talks all sorts of uh, about all sorts of history. It's, it's a really nice talk. I definitely recommend watching the whole thing. Um, but one of the slides that he focuses on is he talks about some myths about Lisp. Pure Lisp never existed. It had assignment and go to, that is to say mutation and like literally go to, like <laughs> jumping uh, to an arbitrary point in the source code before it had conditional expressions and recursion. As far as I know, Lisp was actually, this is from 1958, was the original language that in, introduced conditional expressions, like if then else that actually evaluates to a value, um, and the first language to introduce recursion. Um, he goes on to say, Lisp was not based on the lambda calculus, despite using the word lambda to denote functions. It was instead based on first order recursion equations, which is uh, from the mathematician Kleene. So basically he's saying that, you know, although we talk about lambda calculus a lot, and we're gonna talk about it some more later on in the talk, um, Lisp itself was not actually based on it. And in fact, the creator of Lisp, uh, although he had heard of lambda calculus and knew about the term lambdas from it, he actually had not really studied it and he did not base Lisp on it. Um, the M language, which is part of Lisp, um, was, was first order, but you could pass a function as a, fam a parameter by quotation, i.e. as the S expression for its code. Basically what he's saying right here is that Lisp original Lisp did not have higher order functions in the sense that we typically associate them with today. What you could do if you wanted was you could basically take the source code of that uh, function, like a string, and pass it in and eval that, which, you know, if you've ever heard of uh, eval in language like JavaScript or something like that, probably alarm bells are going off like, that's not a good idea. That's not a good way to do higher order functions or to simulate them. Um, but that was what you would have to do in original Lisp. And then he goes on to say, this gives the wrong binding rules for free variables, dynamic instead of lexicographic. So that's where our example previously of, of dynamic binding comes from. If you imagine if you're just basically copy pasting that code in there and then evaling it, yeah, it's gonna run using whatever's in scope from wherever you copy pasted it because it doesn't know about what was originally in scope. All it knows is the string of the source code. That's where dynamic binding comes from. And yeah, the ergonomics are not as nice as lexical binding. He then goes on to sort of give an example of this. And then finally he notes, not until Scheme, which is in 1975, uh, did versions of Lisp with static binding, or AKA lexical binding appear. And today all versions of Lisp are Lambda calculus based. So this is really interesting because we've been talking about this sort of like, you know, functional programming being possible, but not ergonomic. I would argue that dynamic binding is another good example of this. Like, yeah, we had Lambdas. They were even called Lambdas in Lisp, but the ergonomics back in 1958 were not great. They're really not what we would associate with like functional programming today with higher order functions. If you said, here's a programming language, and the way that you do higher order functions is you pass a string of the source code into it and then eval that in the middle of the function, I don't know how many people would say, yeah, that feels like functional programming to me. Now, here's the question. What's the difference between this unergonomic way of doing functions in Lisp in 1958 and this other unergonomic way of doing functional programming in Java in 1995? I mean, both of them, yeah, you can write the same kind of stuff. I mean, arguably, the Java one, Java inner classes did actually have lexical binding. So in some sense, you could even argue that the Java version of this was more ergonomic for functional programming, despite being more verbose than the Lisp version, because at least it got the binding right. Something to think about. Okay, <laughs> and this, is, this is kind of the strangest part to me, is to realize that both Java and Lisp got lexical closures 15 plus years after the initial release of the language. Like people give Java a lot of hash for you know having taken so long to finally get lambdas. I mean, Lisp took that long to get lambdas. I mean, not, not exactly the same amount of time, but like 15 plus years after the initial release before they got it, before Scheme came out uh, in Lisp and before lambdas landed in Java 8. So lexical closures are definitely ergonomic for fu functional programming, but they're not required. You can do functional programming without it. You certainly could do functional programming in original Lisp. I think a lot of people would agree with that. Some people, including Wikipedia, as we'll see later, consider Lisp to maybe be the first functional programming language ever, but they're not essential. 
They're not required. You can do it without them. It's just the ergonomics are going to be worse. And honestly, the same thing is true of first class functions. I mean, we saw from the inner class example in Java, that was not a function. That was an inner class that had a method inside it. It was not a function. And yet you could do functional programming in Java before it got lambdas. It just ergonomics were not as good. And in fact, you can go even further with this. You can do functional programming in C. This is an article about, and this is not just somebody who was doing like a toy project and was like, I wanna see if I can do functional programming in C. No, he was actually talking about, I had a real problem and I used my experience in functional programming to solve this problem and help make my code better in C. And you can go even further than that. <laughs> Here's a Stack Overflow talking about functional code in assembly, like pure functions in assembly language. And that's even more bizarre because if you think about it, assembly doesn't even have the concept of functions. It's just machine instructions. So like, how can this possibly be? Well, again, I come back to, do you actually need literal first-class functions to do a functional programming style? I mean, if inner classes are sufficient in Java, what's the difference between that and a raw function pointer? I mean, the answer is there's no capture, but again, Lisp didn't really have capture. So do you necessarily need that? I think the answer is no. I think even if you don't have the most basic thing, the word function is the first word in functional programming, but you actually can do that style of trying to write pure quote unquote functions, even if you don't have that as a primitive, if all you've got is a raw function pointer, which is just an address to jump to in memory, it still can help you out in the same way that the functional programming style can help you out in Java pre lambdas and in original Lisp. So yeah, I would say even functions are ergonomic for functional programming, but still not required. They're not essential. Conceptually, yeah, conceptually you have an idea of functions, but are they required to be in the language for you to do a functional programming style? I think the answer is no. Okay, so what are the minimal language features required to do FP? I think it's none, not even functions. Any programming language can do functional programming, I claim. And if that's true, then certainly none of these other programming language features are required either to do functional programming. Like immutability, not required. Pattern matching, not required. Macros, I mean, all these things, purity, laziness, these are all things that are somewhat associated with functional programming languages. And you might say that these sort of feel like functional programming if that's what you're used to. But if you used a programming language that didn't have any of these and not even functions, I claim you could still do functional programming, at least from a stylistic perspective and get the same kinds of benefits that the C programmer got when he applied functional programming techniques to his C code. Now, granted, they do certainly improve ergonomics uh, when you have access to, to nice language features. I'm making a pure functional programming language because I think that, that having a language level support for uh, functional programming is a great idea. But I have to acknowledge that even as someone who's that committed to functional programming languages, and who's been using them uh, exclusively in my career for the past five plus years, um, they're not required for functional programming. Okay, so having said that, I would encourage you to explore the different ergonomics of different languages. Like if you've only ever done functional programming in one or maybe two of these languages, try another one, see what it feels like. You might actually find that you like it more, especially if you've never had the experience of using a language that was designed from the ground up to be a functional programming language. Um, the ergonomics are pretty much across the board gonna be better if you're using a language where this was the idea, this was the plan, rather than a language that sort of much later ended up deciding that, oh, we should actually add some functional programming language features, um, even though that's not what the language was originally designed to do. Okay, so that brings me to, what is the relationship between functional programming and mathematics? So this is another thing that people talk about a lot. I ended up learning a lot about this uh, when I was trying to answer the question, what, what's the original definition of functional programming? I wanted to just say like, okay, surely there was a time when no one used the term functional programming. And then at some point, somebody used it for the first time. And then now today it's, it's sort of part of our shared lexicon. So what was that first moment? Like what's the earliest documented example I can find of someone using the words functional programming? So I thought it might be Alonzo Church who uh, created the Lambda calculus back in the 1930s. Because a lot of times when people talk about functional programming, they'll sort of hand wavy say, you know, functional programming originated with the Lambda calculus. Um, and if you look on Wikipedia, uh, talking about the Lambda calculus, it says it influenced the design of the Lisp programming language. Eh, not really true. <laughs> uh, it influenced the design of like later Lisp, so not the original Lisp, um, and functional programming languages in general, which I certainly think is true. But did Alonzo Church in the 1930s actually use the words functional programming? I cannot find any evidence of this. Um, I looked through some of his early papers, 
I don't see that in there. Um, I think that came later, even if lambda calculus was obviously very influential in functional programming, I don't think it was the, where the term originated. Um, next place I looked uh, was John McCarthy, creator of LISP uh, in the 1950s, so about 20-ish years later. Um, Wikipedia says LISP implemented in 1958 was the first dynamically typed functional programming language. I think that's a reasonable claim. I'm not going to try and debate like was it or was it not the first functional programming language. Some people will say it is, some people will say it isn't. Um, it is weird. I, I think if you want to be consistent, though, you should say that uh, functional programming does not require lexical closures if you think that, uh, or being based on the lambda calculus, if you think Lisp is the first functional programming language. But regardless, did John McCarthy use the term functional programming? Again, I can't find any evidence of this. Um, I have not seen it in his early like 1950s papers about you know Lisp and symbolic execution and all that stuff. Um, can't find it. The first example I can find of the words functional programming being used in a paper was by Peter Landon, uh, who created lexical closures. Uh, in the 1960s, he wrote a paper uh, that, that used this term. Um, he's a British computer scientist, one of the first to realize that lambda calculus could be used to model a programming language. Um, definitely strongly influenced by lambda calculus, as we will see. Um, as far as I can tell, he was the first person to write down the, the term functional programming in like an academic paper. Um, it was this one. It was called The Next 700 Programming Languages, and it's from 1966. Um, we can already see in this paper like a lot of things that are familiar to us today in terms of functional programming. He's describing a language, which we'll, we'll get to in a second. Um, he talks about, you know, it's oriented around expressions rather than statements. Does that sound familiar? Um, a non-procedural, aka purely functional subsystem of this language. So he's actually talking about not just functional programming, but like pure functional programming with no side effects as part of this language. Um, this is where he uh, he talks about functional programming. Um, he, he uses the phrase for the first time, functional programming, in a sentence in which he's actually talking about syntax, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, has little to do with functional notation. Um, he goes on to talk about, uh, he references another paper, he talks about a correspondence between X and Church's lambda notation, basically talking about like the relationship between lambda calculus and mathematics and similar concepts in uh, computer programming. The name for his language that, that he's describing here is called iSwim, which is short for I see what I mean, which I also thought was kind of funny because here I am trying to find the original authoritative definition of functional programming. And all I get is this sentence, which doesn't define it. It just sort of uses it. And then it's in the context of a programming language called, yeah, see what I mean? See what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and so um, unfortunately, I, I did not end up finding an authoritative definition here. I just found this, this usage of it where he just kind of casually drops it in there as if the, the reader already knows what it means. So my conclusion is like, What's the original definition of functional programming? Maybe there isn't one. It just kind of seems like this colloquialism that people were talking about at the time that like Peter Landon knew. And at some point he wrote this paper and used this term that people were colloquially using. And you know what? I bet they all probably had different ideas about exactly what it meant. So maybe it's always been this way. Maybe functional programming has always been this sort of vaguely shared understanding of related ideas between programmers. I think that's the most plausible answer. So to sum up, what I ended up sort of learning in the context, uh, in the course of exploring the, the origins of the term functional programming, first of all, it definitely referred to mathematical functions. Like the functional and functional programming, like all these papers from around this time, they're all talking about math, lambda calculus, mathematical properties, and wanting programming to try and sort of like get some of those benefits from mathematics or sort of steal some ideas from there. Um, so definitely that's where the function, uh, the word function comes from, is mathematical functions. Um, Secondly, um, I learned, you know, like Lisp is actually not coming from uh, a, a lambda calculus background, but it is coming from Clayton's ideas on functional uh, recursion as in mathematical function recursion. Um, so even more math influence in the whole like Lisp branch of things. And then iSwim, and, uh, which influenced ML and Haskell and all these other languages, um, definitely inspired by lambda calculus. And then eventually lambda calculus ended up getting to the Lisp family through Scheme and, and, uh, and on and on it goes. So definitely there is a very, very strong undercurrent of mathematics sort of like that's bound up in the origin story of functional programming. So what about category theory? I mean, quite often I've heard people say, if you wanna get into functional programming, you're gonna to have to learn some category theory. Is that true? Well, um, so in Python, uh, you have a concept of lists, like a, a, you know, in other languages it's called an array, but in Python they're, they're known as lists. Um, and when Python programmers are talking about lists, they say lists. Um, Haskell also has lists, but it's quite common that you'll hear Haskell programmers talk about the list monad instead. 
It's the same idea. Um, they're both talking about lists, you know, a data structure called list in their respective languages. Um, the difference is that, you know, colloquially, Haskell is referred to it as the list monad. Now, in both languages, like Python lists and Haskell lists are both monads. It's like, that's just a true fact about them. It's really just there's a cultural difference about how they're talked about. Now, part of this, granted, is that Haskell has monad in, as part of its standard library. It's really difficult to use Haskell completely without learning what a monad is. It's very easy to learn Python without learning what a monad is, even though both of them have monads. So um, is that required? Well, no. I mean, in Elm, for example, which is also a pure functional programming language like Haskell, um, statically typed, type inference, <laughs> a lot of similarities between Elm and Haskell. But culturally, in Elm, we just call them lists. Um, that's totally fine. Uh, similarly, in the rock programming language that I'm uh, working on, so just called lists. Um, you know, monads don't appear in the standard library. There aren't really any category theory terms. It's just a cultural thing. And actually, like if you look at the, the, the breadth of functional programming, whether people are doing like the functional programming style or it's just a functional programming language that's not Haskell or a descendant of Haskell, you really actually don't find that much category theory terminology. Um, it really is just kind of like a, a, a niche of functional programming that, that tends to use that terminology. Um, but again, like you can find different experiences no matter where you look. Um, there's some overlap between mathematicians and programmers and some overlap between category theory terminology usage and programmers and mathematicians. Some people are two of these three, some people are three of these three, but plenty of people are just one of these three and they're interested in programming, but not math and not category theory. And that's fine. All of those are fine. So I would say based on what I've learned, I don't think that category theory is required for functional programming, um, but it's something that you can learn if you want to. And in fact, it's also something you can learn if you have no interest in programming at all. Um, they're just kind of separate. And uh, culturally, you may find that it's uh, more of a thing, especially in languages where category th ter uh, theory terminology appears in the standard library, like in Haskell. But there's plenty of other functional programming languages that don't have it. So if it's not something you're interested in learning, you don't really have to. OK. And finally, this brings us to the functional programming style. So what's the common ground stylistically between all these languages? Well, so far, uh, what, from what we've explored, it doesn't actually seem that they all have like some particular set of features that they all need to have, not even functions. That doesn't seem to be a requirement. Also, although it seems like math is like an integral part of the origin story of functional programming, I really can't find any evidence that math is sort of like part of the definition of it. So it's not like you need to have any particular math background or usage of math in order to do functional programming in any of these languages. So what's the common ground between them? Like, what are, what are you going to find as sort of the common thread I expect uh, with like the talks you're going to see at this conference using more pure functions. I think that's really kind of what it comes down to. So pure functions, if you're not familiar with the term, um, basically uh, have two rules. If you give them the same arguments, they have to return the same return value no matter what. And uh, they can't perform any side effects along the way. I really like my, my favorite analogy for pure functions is that pure functions are basically, they're not exactly, but basically lookup tables. So for example, let's say we have a function called string length. And if I call it passing the string pi, it returns two. If I pass functional, it returns 10. If I pass conf 2022, it returns nine. This could be implemented. This function could be implemented internally as a lookup table. Like whatever string you give it, it's going to just look up the answer in the lookup table and return it. And that's it. No side effects. And no matter what arguments you give it, it's always going to return exactly the same answer. So if you wanted to, you could take the body of this function, whatever is actually in there. And theoretically, you could return it, re re replace the entire body of that function with a gigantic lookup table for like all the possible strings it could possibly accept. Now, okay, that's like assuming unlimited system resources. Obviously, in practice, you would not actually be able to implement it that way. But the idea is that any pure function should, in theory, given unlimited resources, be able to replace its entire body, its entire implementation, with a gigantic lookup table. If you can't do that, you don't have a pure function. That's the rule. And really, if you think about it, mathematical functions work the same way. Mathematical functions don't have side effects. And, <laughs> and certainly, if you give them the same arguments, they're expected to give the same return value every single time. OK. So actually, I mean, pure functions are, in some sense, like mathematical functions. And certainly, based on the history we've learned, it seems like that's what people wanted them to be more like. I mean, that's what, that was sort of the goal, is to get more mathematical properties out of programming. Um, but there is one important difference between uh, pure functions and mathematical functions, which is they can crash. <laughs> uh, system resources, as it turns out, are finite. So you can get, for example, a stack overflow. Um, they can also hang. like They can run indefinitely and not terminate. That's also a bummer. Um, so this is a little bit awkward. Um, and there's this, this sort of natural question that arises from this, which is like, can computers do arbitrary math? 
I mean, can we ever get to pure functions being equal to mathematical functions? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, and to prove this to you, just here's a thought experiment. Let's imagine that you were thinking of the biggest number you can conceive of, just digits and digits and digits for ages, huge, huge number. Now raise that number to the power of itself over and over and over again, as many times as you can imagine. The resulting number will be so big that even if you don't do any operations on it, it can be represented in the universe, not just on your computer, but like in the entire, if you repurposed every, all the matter in the entire universe, and all you were trying to do with all the matter in the entire universe was represent this one number, you can't do it, it's too big. It won't fit in the entire universe. Math, unfortunately, is infinite. Even just that one number is not representable, let alone any functions that might involve that number as like a constant inside of it. So can we ever get to a point where functions running on a computer are as powerful as mathematical functions? In other words, can we ever get to a point where there exists no mathematical functions that cannot be modeled by computers? Unfortunately not. I mean, computers can never have true mathematical functions in the sense that there will always exist a mathematical function that cannot be represented by a computer because math is infinite and the physical universe is finite and computers live in the physical universe, unfortunately. So we can sort of asymptotically approach this at best, but we can never quite get there. Okay, so one of the things that pure functions can do is they can crash, this is unfortunate. But there's also some other asterisks in there that we just kind of like hand wave away when we're talking about pure functions versus mathematical functions. Like technically they affect memory when they run, like they allocate memory on the stack or on the heap. Um, and we don't really consider that a side effect even though that is observable within the system. I mean, if you have another, you know, uh, <laughs> another function running that's like not a pure function, it's gonna be able to observe that memory. So we kind of like to say like, okay, but for our purposes, we're not gonna treat that as a side effect. And yes, we know they can crash and they can you know, not terminate, they can run out of memory. Um, but all of those, all of those aside, um, we're just gonna you know, otherwise treat them under the assumption that those things like won't happen or that the, the changing of memory won't matter. Um, also, as we've seen earlier, they don't really even have to be functions. I mean, mathematical functions, yes, are functions, but we can get kind of the same benefits with much worse ergonomics, even if we don't have access to lexical closures or something like uh, inner classes in Java or even functions themselves. Okay, so putting all this together, I'm gonna claim that the functional programming style basically boils down to using more pure functions, which in practice means avoiding mutation and avoiding side effects. And you can do both of these even if you don't actually have access to functions. This I claim is the functional programming style, avoid mutation and avoid side effects. And so what's the common ground between all of these different things that you'll see at the conference? I think it's avoiding mutation and avoiding side effects. So to give an example of this, um, and sort of the, the difference in ergonomics here, let's talk about like functional programming in JavaScript, which is actually what I got into first. Okay, it was CoffeeScript, but I know a lot, not a lot of people know about CoffeeScript anymore. So let's just pretend it's JavaScript close enough, basically the same language in, in a lot of ways. Um, and, uh, and, and comparing that to functional programming in Haskell. So let me tell you a quick story. Um, years ago, I was working at a different company and uh, we were basically building a product and the team that we were on was really bought into functional programming. We were using CoffeeScript, again, pretend it's JavaScript, um, but basically the rules that we tried to follow were like, just pretend it's Haskell. Like don't do any mutation, don't do any side effects except at the very edges of the system. Um, let's try to follow all the same rules that we would in Haskell. Everybody was bought into this idea. I had one coworker who was used to Haskell. I was actually used to CoffeeScript. So I had no prior experience in doing like functional programming in an actual functional language. And so to me, the ergonomics were like, wow, I, I noticed that it's, it's a lot easier to do my programming. Um, I, I find that this is less error prone than what I'm used to. But my coworker really had a lot of trouble because he was used to Haskell. He was like, this is so much harder for me. Like I, I, he actually ended up leaving the team because it, it was just so impossibly difficult for him to give up the ergonomics that he was used to from Haskell and do functional programming in JavaScript where it was just such a much more hostile environment than he was used to for that style. Now, in contrast, today I work at a company called No Red Ink. Uh, we make software for English teachers and we use Elm on the front end and Haskell, uh, not exclusively, but we do use it um, quite a bit on the back end. And basically uh, now I know <laughs> what my coworker was talking about in the past. Um, the ergonomics difference is huge if you have access to all this stuff. Um, doing the functional programming style in a language that wasn't designed for it is very, very different ergonomically and in terms of like what it feels like day-to-day -day programming um, when you actually have access to a full language that was designed to be used in that way. 
Elm and Haskell are both pure functional programming languages. But again, lots of other languages at this conference um, are, you know, like Elixir and Clojure and stuff like that, um, are dedicated functional programming languages um, that are not pure functional. There's lots of different ways to, to go with this. But the point being, if you actually have a language that's built on this, the ergonomics are very, very different. Um, by the way, if that sounds interesting to you, uh, if you'd like to use a pure functional programming language to work, uh, we're hiring. Um, okay, so I claim that avoiding mutation and side effects is sort of the, uh, the, the common thread between all of these. This is the functional programming style, but the ergonomics definitely may vary depending on the language and its level of support for that. Okay, so summarize all the things we talked about. Um, building this programming language called Rock. It's a purely functional language. Compiler is written in Rust. Um, I had this uh, it, it, expectation based on all these things I'd seen about functional programming in Rust that, oh, this is going to match with my idea of functional programming. It's going to feel just like Elm. But really, it turns out that we were, to some extent, talking past each other. I mean, all these articles that we're talking about functional programming in Rust, they have a different mental model of functional programming and especially the corresponding ergonomics around that than I did. And I ended up kind of getting burned by that and, and having an unpleasant experience um, when I tried to apply functional programming techniques like parser combinators that I was used to in Rust. Um, so these different experiences, you know, can lead to different expectations and you're going to find a lot of different uh, expectations and experiences at uh, the different talks that you hear in the conference. And so you should be aware of that, you know, what, when the speaker is talking about their experience of functional programming, it's probably going to be different than your experience and probably different than the other speakers experiences. You should keep that in mind as you're listening to every talk. We talked about so, sort of these, uh, looking at this from these three different angles. So what are the minimal features required to do functional programming? As it turns out, None, <laughs> not even functions. It's possible to do a functional programming style, even in assembly language, with terrible ergonomics. What's the relationship between functional programming and math? Definitely, there is a very strong historical influence. This seems to me to be where the term functional programming came from, was people looking into the relationships between mathematics and programming. And pure functions themselves are definitely based on mathematical functions. The function in functional programming comes from mathematical functions, as far as I can tell. And finally, what is the functional programming style? It's avoiding mutation and avoiding side effects. Of course, the ergonomics <laughs> uh, may vary depending on uh, which language you're, uh, you're doing that style in. So what is, at the end of the day, the essence of functional programming? I think it's avoiding mutation and avoiding side effects. Thanks very much. Thanks, Richard. That was awesome, as usual. <laughs> cool. Uh, I did not know about Lisp, uh, th that, that background specifically. So thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a uh, little known fact. Cool. Uh, let's see if there are any questions uh, folks have. If you have any questions, please uh, put it in the Q&A section. Uh, as of now, I don't see any questions. But if uh, folks do have some questions, please put it in the Q&A section. All right, we have a uh, first question here from Kim. Uh, so we have so far heard about the essence of functional programming. What is the essence of a functional programmer? Ah, what is the essence of a functional programmer? I mean, uh, I guess that that's probably a subject of an entire other talk, right? Um, I don't have a good answer off the top of my head. Uh, I, I don't know if, if you can paint all functional programmers with such a broad brush as to say that we all boil down to the same essential thing other than maybe we use functional programming <laughs> maybe that's it maybe it doesn't need a whole talk <laughs> all right cool uh so thanks kim for that uh i think we have one question again now from connor uh you mentioned david uh, turner have you looked into krc or sasl the language he worked uh, on miranda um, I know about SASL. I don't recognize the other acronym. Uh, I think I've seen it like his Wikipedia article, but uh, I don't actually know anything about either of those. Um, I, I'm only really familiar with Miranda in the context of it being a, a predecessor to Haskell, but I'm sure there's some interesting history there too. Okay, cool. Next question is from Manoj. Uh, he's saying, which platform does Rock Lang uh, work on? Works ah, on. Uh, so Rock compiles to machine code, uh, so you can actually run it on, you know, uh, window. Well, actually, the compiler doesn't support Windows yet, uh, so it's like work in progress. But um, uh, like you know, Mac, Linux, uh, so it it, uh, it also compiles to WebAssembly, so you can uh, run it in the browser if you want. Um, on rocklang.org, I have some demos of of it running in uh, different environments. So um, and I 
keep an eye out because uh, later this month I'm giving, or sorry, in about a month, I'm giving another talk where I'm going to demo it, uh, compiling to like different platforms like Mac and Linux and stuff like that. Cool. Uh, blazing through, there are more questions coming in, so that's great. Uh, we have the next question from Ram. He's saying, can we say we can compare different uh, function programming languages to get the best, like, is there a best function programming language? If you <laughs> is there a best functional programming language? I mean, I think that that question is similar to the question of, is there a best programming language? And I think the answer is, it depends on what you're doing. Um, there, there, whatever you're doing, there will probably be a best prog functional programming language for that task in the same way that there's a best programming language for that task. Um, each of the different languages of this conference and other languages have different strengths and weaknesses. So I'd say it really is very context dependent on like what your actual project is. Cool. We have a uh, next question from Nische. Uh, is composition of functions not essential to functional programming? Is composition of functions not essential to functional programming? I think that's a great question. Um, I mean, my conclusion is no. Uh, I, I think um, you definitely can still get the same kind of benefits. Um, like uh, this C article is a good example of this, where fundamentally, like by avoiding mutation and being sort of like aware of side effects and trying to isolate them and avoid them, um, he got a lot of benefits from that. He didn't do any functional composition. Um, I don't think that that's essential. And in fact, honestly, um, in terms of especially like point free function function composition, I have used that less and less the more experience I've gotten with functional programming. So yeah, I, I don't think it's essential at all. All right, cool. Uh, I think we just doing a quick time check here. I think we could do, uh, yeah, a couple of more questions. So uh, yeah. next one is from Dheeraj. Uh, some FP languages support category theory, uh, like uh, FP languages like Haskell and Scala. But some languages like Clojure doesn't have much of category theory and still FP language. Why is it so? I, like I said, I, I think it's just cultural. Um, like, uh, you know, we, we talk about like uh, the origins of functional programming and, the, and where a lot of these languages come from. Um, all of them, you know, have some sort of mathematical background, but different mathematicians and different computer scientists talk about different things and, and look at the world in different ways. Um, like in Haskell, for example, uh, I know that one of the reasons that monads are really big in Haskell is that Philip Wadler um, discovered a really nice way to do pure functional IO. And the way that he discovered that was actually in the context of reading a paper from a different mathematician on, uh, on this concept of monads and mathematics that led him to discover a really nice um, technique for doing IO in a pure functional language, namely Haskell. And so that just became a big part of Haskell, like, because that was like the origin of how he discovered that. But there's other languages that use that same style of IO, but just don't talk about it in terms of category theory. Both are totally valid. I mean, there's, 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 there's nothing saying that you need to use category theory um, in order to do functional programming. And there's nothing saying that if you use category theory to do functional programming, that you shouldn't. Um, it really is just kind of a, a stylistic choice and different communities have different choices about how they approach it. Cool. Uh, next one is from Yogi. Uh, Yogi is saying, given the physical reality of computers that uh, you mentioned, is there any truth to saying list programmers know the value of everything and the cost of nothing? <laughs> Replace <laughs> this function. I, I forget where that quote comes from, but yeah, I mean, this was this was like a. Um, I, I think what they were talking about originally was it was actually about garbage collection, if I remember right. Um, they're talking about like the value of everything and the cost of nothing, meaning that like so. Lisp is actually also among other firsts. It was the first garbage collected programming language, um, and back in the day, that that oh, Alan Perlis, cool. Um, and I think he was talking about the garbage collection, the fact that like Lisp ran pretty slowly back then. Might have been that, and it was might have been all the con cells. Um, but uh, as I recall, it was a, a dig on the performance of Lisp, uh, you know. Um, and so today, when lots of languages are garbage collected, in fact, that's like the most common and most popular way to do programming. I don't think that joke makes as much sense anymore. Um, but I actually don't think that was about functional programming as much as it was about garbage collection. I could be wrong, though. All right, cool. I think I'll take one last question and then we will move to the Hangout section. So the last question here is from Saurabh. Uh, how important are types to FP? Ooh, how important are types to FP? Honestly, uh, for, from my perspective to functional programming, I think they're just totally orthogonal. 
I mean, uh, there was this debate over like type versus untyped lambda calculus back in the day. Um, but ultimately at the end of the day, like you can do avoiding mutation and side effects in any language regardless of type system. To me, uh, types are much more about ergonomics in a totally separate distinct category from FP versus imperative. In the same way that you can have functional programming languages with dynamic types, static types, or, or whatever else, gradual types. And you can have an imperative language with dynamic types, static types, gradual types, whatever else. Um, it's just an orthogonal concern. Uh, obviously you can categorize functional languages into one or the other, but really, I mean, the, the question of like, which ergonomics do you prefer and like what type system features do you like or dislike about a, a particular language? You can do that, uh, have that same debate regardless of whether or not you're talking about it in the context of functional programming. So I'd say they're totally separate. All right, cool. Uh, I know there are more questions. So again, I appreciate everyone asking questions. Uh, it's great. Uh, thank you everyone for listening in and being such a good audience, not making too much noise. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks uh, again, Richard, for uh, the fantastic talk and uh, helping us kind of go back a little bit in time and understand yeah. the essence of function programming. And it's a great way to kickstart this conference, uh, kind of trying to set that base definition and maybe as we go through uh we will uh see if our mileage varies in terms of the experience and economics that you mentioned 